Here we're going to compute a limit by exploiting lots of nice tricks and facts from Calculus 2. So in particular, we want to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of n factorial over n. And we're going to use the following fact, which is not immediately obviously helpful, but we'll see how it's helpful. If f is an increasing function on the interval a, b, and then we partition this interval a, b into subintervals, x0 to x1, x1 to x2, all the way up to xn minus 1 to xn, then the left-hand Riemann sum is less than or equal to the value of the integral, which is less than or equal to the right-hand Riemann sum. We're noticed by the indexing, we have the left-hand Riemann sum as the sum as i goes from 0 up to n minus 1 of f of xi delta x, whereas the right-hand Riemann sum is the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of xi delta x. There's like a nice visual description of why this works, and you'll see that the increasingness of f really helps you out here as you move from taking rectangles with height given by the left-hand endpoint to height given by the right-hand endpoint. Okay, so let's maybe use this fact to prove a couple of identities. So the first identity we'll look at is built off of the following integral. So we've got the integral from 1 to n of the natural log of x dx. But next, we'll split this interval 1 to n up into n separate subintervals. So I'll write it as the integral from 1 to 2 of the natural log of x dx plus the integral from 2 to 3 of ln x dx plus all the way up to the integral from n minus 1 to n of the natural log of x dx. But now, since the natural log of x is an increasing function, we can replace this function with its value on the upper endpoint for each of these integrals. So that will mean that this is less than or equal to the integral from 1 to 2 of the natural log of 2 dx plus the integral from 2 to 3 of the natural log of 3 dx. And that's going all the way up to the integral from n minus 1 to n of the natural log of n dx. So we're mimicking the same thing that's going on over here with our left-hand and right-hand endpoint sums. In fact, this is a right-hand endpoint sum. We're just writing it a little bit differently. Okay, but now we're integrating constant functions, in this case natural log 2, natural log 3, natural log 4, all the way up to natural log n over unit intervals. So that means these integrals in the end will just be those constants. So we have this is equal to the natural log of 2 plus ln 3 plus ln 4 ending at the natural log of n. But now I can put all of those together using a standard product rule for logs, or maybe it's a product sum rule that says if you have a sum of logarithms, I can put them together and I take a product of what the arguments were. So that'll leave me with the natural log of 2 times 3 times 4 all the way up to n. But that's a well-known special number of n factorial, so we have this is the natural log of n factorial. So let's bring this inequality up to the top and we'll calculate a similar inequality involving natural log of n factorial. By mimicking what's going on with a right-hand Riemann sum for an increasing function, we just derived the following inequality, which is the integral from one to n of ln x dx is less than ln of n factorial. Now we want to derive a similar inequality involving the natural log of n factorial that will put something on the other side of it. So let's see maybe how that will go. Instead of st starting with this integral, we're, we'll start with the integral from 1 to n plus 1 of the natural log of x dx is in fact larger than this natural log of n factorial, and we'll use the same kind of strategy. So let's split this up into a sum of integrals over the constituent subintervals. So this will be the integral from 1 to 2 of natural log of x dx plus the integral from 2 to 3 ln x dx plus all the way up to the integral from n to n plus 1 of natural log of x dx. 
And now we'll do a replacement, but instead of replacing with the upper end point, we will replace with the lower end point. And again, since natural log is increasing, that means we're gonna create something that is smaller. It's just like taking the left-hand Riemann sum as described over here. So that means we've got this is bigger than the integral from one to two of natural log of one dx plus integral from two to three natural log of two dx all the way up to the integral from n to n plus one of natural log of n dx. But just as we had before, we know that we're integrating constant functions over unit intervals, those, so that just gives us those constants. This is equal to natural log of one plus natural log of two plus all the way up to natural log of n. Now, of course, the natural log of one is equal to zero, so we don't even need to worry about that. And then we can put these together just like we did in the last step, and that'll become the natural log of n factorial. So that's nice. So we have the integral from one to n plus one of ln x dx is bigger than natural log of n factorial. So let's take that and complete our inequality up here. So we've got the integral from one to n plus one of natural log of x dx. Now let's get rid of the rest of the stuff on the board and we'll actually calculate these two integrals exactly using integration by parts. So we just got done building the following inequality. Now we're ready to integrate exactly the two ends of this inequality. But we can do that all at once by looking at the integral from 1 to m of natural log of x dx, where of course m is n here and m is n plus 1 over here. So this is the integral of an inverse function. And from calculus 2, we learned that in order to integrate inverse functions, you generally use integration by parts. So let's maybe go ahead and make this setup for integration by parts. We'll take u to be the natural log of x, and we'll take dv to be equal to dx. So we'll take u to be the natural log of x, because if I take that derivative, it becomes simpler. Okay, so now we'll take du, which will be 1 over x dx. So it's no longer a transcendental function. That's why I said it was easier. And then here, v will be equal to x. And now let's recall the formula is the integral or the antiderivative of u dv is equal to u times v minus the integral of v du, where if we have a definite integral, we're doing evaluation right here. Okay, nice. So let's see what we have. So this is going to be equal to u times v. So that's x ln x evaluated at 1 and m. <clears throat> and then minus the integral of v du. So that'll be minus the integral from one to m of, look at what we have, x over x dx. So that's just one dx. So we have something that looks a little bit like that. So that's actually pretty easy to work with. Notice doing this evaluation right here, we'll get m times the natural log of m minus 1 times the natural log of 1. Natural log of 1 is 0, so we don't need to worry about that. And then we have minus m plus 1 from taking the antiderivative here and then plugging in the endpoints and then changing the sign based on this minus sign right here. Okay, so that's looking good. So now let's take this integral, which we have just derived, and plug it into our inequality right here, and then reassess the situation. Putting everything together that we've done so far, we end at the following inequality. So we have n, natural log of n minus n plus 1, is less than natural log of n factorial, which in turn is less than n plus 1, natural log of n plus 1 minus n. So first, what I want to do from here is take these multipliers of the natural log terms and bring them inside the natural log as exponents. So that will leave us with the natural log of n to the n 
minus n plus 1 is less than the natural log of n factorial. That's not changing, which is less than the natural log of n plus 1 to the n plus 1 minus n. But now we look at our goal, and our goal doesn't have any natural logs. So how could we change this guy right here, which has natural logs all over the place, to something without natural logs? Well, maybe we'll exponentiate all parts of this inequality. So I'll just put an arrow here and then put exp to say that we're putting all of this in the exponent of e. So let's see what that'll give us. So we'll have e to the natural log of n to the n times e to the minus n plus 1, where I used some exponent rules here. That is less than n factorial, which in turn is less than e to the natural log of n plus 1 to the n plus 1 times e to the minus n. Okay, so let's see a little bit of quick simplification that we can do. So this e and this natural log will cancel. This will leave us with n to the n. This in turn cancels down to n plus 1 to the n plus 1. Okay, so now let's rewrite that where we've taken some of our exponential terms downstairs. So this is just a rewriting step. So that's going to leave us with e times n to the n over e to the n is less than n factorial, which in turn is less than n plus 1 to the n plus 1 over e to the n. So that's what we're left with at this stage. Now, take a look at what we've got over here. We've got something that looks like the nth root of n factorial over n. Well, we can get an nth root just by taking the nth root of all sides, but to get the n in the denominator, we probably want to divide by this n to the n term. So let's do that. I'll just erase this n to the n term, and I'll put it in the denominator here, which means I also need to put it in the denominator here. And then finally, for a simplification on the right-hand side, I'll take this n plus 1 to the n plus 1 and write it as n plus 1 to the n times n plus 1. So just to reiterate, I have n plus 1 over n to the n times n plus 1 over e to the n when all is said and done. So again, I took n copies of this n plus 1 and I combined them with that n in the denominator. That gave us this first term. And then to build the next board, I'll take the nth root of all of the parts of this inequality. And I guess I should say that I was able to take the exponential and the nth root because those are increasing functions, so they maintain these orders of inequality. Okay, so let's take this nth root and we'll see what we have at the top of the next board. After cleaning up a little bit of what we ended with, we have the following inequality, which is almost done. We have e to the 1 over n over e is less than the nth root of n factorial over n, which is good, that's our goal object, which in turn is less than 1 over e times 1 plus 1 over n times n plus 1 to the 1 over n. Okay, nice. Now let's see what happens as n goes to infinity. So let's see. On this side, as n tends toward infinity, this is tending towards e to the 0, but e to the 0 is 1. That means this whole portion right here is tending to 1 over e. Then, as n tends towards infinity here, we're left with the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of n factorial over n. In other words, our goal limit. Where, of course, when you take limits like this, strict inequalities turn into non-strict inequalities. Then next, what happens as n tends towards infinity over here? Well, let's notice that this 1 over n will trend off towards 0, and we'll be left with 1 over e times the limit as n approaches infinity of n plus 1 to the 1 over n. So there's one last little limit to calculate. If we can show that this thing right here is equal to 1, then we're done by the squeeze theorem. We will have squeezed the value of this goal limit between 1 over e and 1 over e. So let's do just that. Let's show that that limit is 1. Let's maybe state it down here as like a finishing claim. So the limit 
as n approaches infinity of n plus 1 to the 1 over n is equal to 1. So first, let's notice that we have an indeterminate form. As n approaches infinity, this approaches infinity, this approaches 0. So this is sometimes called type infinity to the 0. OK. So how can we tackle this? Well, we'll tackle this using the standard method that you learn in like a calculus class. So let's set L equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of n plus 1 to the 1 over n. And we'll do a transformation on this limit so that it's either a 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity in determinant form. And thus, we can use L'Hopital's rule. So we've got the natural log of L is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n times the natural log of n plus 1. But now if we look at that again, this is now type infinity over infinity, which means we're allowed to apply L'Hopital's rule. Let's take the derivative of the numerator and the denominator. So, I mean, this is a bit sketchy because generally n is reserved for a discrete variable, whereas x is for a continuous variable. But let's play it fast and loose and just take the derivative with respect to n. So we'll have the limit as n approaches infinity of, so the derivative of the numerator will give us 1 over n plus 1. Derivative of the denominator is just 1, so this is all over 1. Now, as n approaches infinity, that will approach 0. So that means the natural log of L is 0, which means L is equal to e to the 0, which is 1. So we've proved our claim, and our claim sets everything in this yellow box equal to 1, which proves that the value of our goal limit is indeed 1 over e. And that's a good place to stop.